my name is Curtis Pilgrim, C U R T I S mm -hmm. P I L G R I M. Mm -hmm. Pilgrim. Pilgrim. Wow. As in Mayflower and Plymouth Rock. Uh huh. My 24th generation, I'm not sure of that uh, number, but uh, grand, 24th great generation? grandfather was and grandmother was John Alden and Priscilla Mullins, who came over on the Mayflower, if that means anything to you. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's uh, the lineage of Puritans? No. Puritans and Separatists were two different. So uh, they are the Separatists? Uh, the Separatists or the Pilgrim Fathers were here before the Puritans. Oh, I see. Uh, Please accept my ignorance. <laughs> it doesn't make me any better. But, uh, it, uh, it's uh, an accident of birth, but uh, we're kind of proud of it as a family. What is your birthday? 24 October 1931. Right at the start of the Great Depression. Yeah. And how was it like uh, growing up? I mean, you were so young so that you didn't feel it, yeah. right? I was the oldest child uh, of uh, a man and a woman who were dairy farmers in northeastern Iowa. Uh, we were a poor family, and yet uh, on a farm we always had plenty to eat and uh, uh, no money at all. But good to be a farmer because you didn't have a shortage of things to eat, right? That's right. We yeah. knew how to raise food. That's good. Uh -huh. Tell me about your family when you were growing up. Your siblings and your parents. What do they do and how about your siblings? Okay, I have one brother, mm. a year and a half younger than I, mm. who's deceased now. He also served during the Korean War. Two years uh, as a medic in Japan in the 181st uh, General Hospital, 18 months in Japan. He didn't get to Korea. What's his name? Kenneth Pilgrim, he's deceased. Uh, yeah, but what's the first name? Kenneth. Kenneth? K-E-N-N-E-T-H. Uh -huh. So he was medic and in Japan for two years, yeah, right? Yeah, U.S. Army Medical uh, Corps. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Where were you born? In northeastern Iowa. And town name? Edgewood. Edgewood? Uh, Edgewood. E D G E W O O D. Uh, on a farm, two miles from Edgewood. When did you graduate your high school? 1949. What high school? Edgewood High School. Mm -hmm. Salutatorian in my class. And. Let me ask this question. Did you know anything about Korea at the time? No. Nothing? Hmm. Any country in Asia did you know? Oh, yes. We what? studied geography. What did you do? Countries throughout yeah. the world. We, we could identify them on a map and we knew the capitals and, and the oceans and that kind of thing. This was regular study in school, in grade school. So what country did you know in Asia? Oh, uh, of course, I lived through the uh, World War II, so Japan and China and uh, uh, not Vietnam so much, and of course... Uh, but I you did, didn't know anything about Korea? No. You never heard of it? Oh, well, casually, mm. but when uh, the North Koreans attacked South Korea on June 25th, 1950, most of us really headed for the maps, we didn't know what, where this was going on, pretty much. Mm. So, I'm talking about before the war, you didn't know much about Korea because it wasn't known to you guys, That's right. right? Yeah. That's right. When did you join the army? I joined the army when I was horrified to see the Korean War begin all over again. Mm. When uh, the China moved into the, North Korea and restarted the war. Uh, I was in college halfway through my sophomore year at Iowa State and uh, Iowa State University. Iowa State uh, University. So after you graduated high school, you went to the Iowa State University. That's right. oh. uh -huh. What did you study? Agriculture. Oh. That's my whole life. 
And when did you join the army? Uh, what year? 1950, well, yeah, now let me think of that one. Uh, in December of 1950, with when 54% of all the Americans, including me, thought World War III had started and that we had lost the chance of saving South Korea, uh, I couldn't sit safely in college any longer when my country was in that kind of trouble with all the people of China and the uh, Soviet Union having the atomic bomb, we figured World War III had started and it would be a nuclear war. So I climbed on my bicycle hey, there at, uh, in college and headed downtown to the recruiting office and volunteered for induction the next morning. When? This was in December of 1950. And where did you get the basic training? Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. Camp? Camp. Camp it was where? not Fort at that time, it was a camp. Yeah, Camp where? McCoy. McCoy, M-C-C-O-Y, -C -C mm. Wisconsin. Huh. Uh -huh. And? That was 16 weeks in the winter. I, I went in in February of 1951 because the December and January had their quotas filled. They couldn't take me any sooner. I would have gone if, <laughs> hmm. if they would have. And I took 16 weeks of, of uh, combat engineer uh, basic training. And uh, What was your expertise, specialty? Uh, combat construction specialist. Mm -hmm. That included eight weeks of infantry basic training too. So for the combat construction, what kind of training did you receive? Um, laying mines, taking up minefields, booby traps, handling explosives, building Bailey bridges under fire, building roads, uh, this, uh, working a rock quarry, that kind of training. Wow, you got a lot of training there. Oh yes. Mm. Yeah. So when did you leave for Korea? Um, leaving, I think, early January 1952. What? You received the uh, basic training in December 1950. No, in 51? February, I, I reported for active duty February 20th, 1951. I joined the Army, actually volunteer reduction in December. I see. But they couldn't take me any sooner because they had their quotas filled. So it was uh, 20 February by the time I reported for duty. But that was 1951, and you're saying that you left for Korea in 1952? Okay, let me explain. Being an engineer unit uh -huh. in Camp McCoy, after 16 weeks of basic, yeah. uh, we were called to Fort Riley, Kansas, because the Call River in Kansas had uh, a record-breaking flood that ruined the post. It took barracks off the foundations, washed out roads, took out a, a big bridge across the Kapal River, just made a terrible mess of the fort. And we were called down. We lived in a tent city. Oh, so you walked there to yes, reconstruct? all summer long. Okay, and that's... December. And so that you uh, departed from the United States to Korea in January 1952. Yeah, uh -huh. Where did you arrive in, in Korea? Okay, Busan. Busan? From Sasebo over to Busan. Ah. Uh, rode a Japanese ship over there. And then by railroad from Busan to Taigu, uh -huh. stayed overnight. And then Taigu up to the Seoul railroad station on the train. Uh, and we were uh, attacked several times by guerrillas. Uh, ahead of our engine on the 
on the narrow gauge train, mm -hmm. uh, we had a flat car, and South Korean troops were behind sandbags on that car and were manning uh, at least one 30 caliber machine gun. Yo. And that's how we got to Seoul. So uh, tell me about the Busan that you saw. How was it? Daegu or any other? How was it, the city? Okay. Um, we got in early in the morning. We'd uh, stayed all night on the deck in a, in a drizzling rain. Uh, when I first saw Pusan and entered the harbor, I was amazed at all the shanties and people uh, on the hills all around. Chinese? Shanties? Shanties. Oh, what shanties. Okay, that's a term for a, a kind of a shack or a shelter. Oh, okay. Uh, shanties. Okay. Yeah, shanties. Yeah, excuse yeah, me. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and uh, of course, the smell was pretty bad, the smoky, smokiness too. And being a farmer, smell well, so what? You know, it didn't bother me, but I, a lot of my buddies uh, acted like they couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. But uh, all, an awful lot of South Korea civilians were down there at Busan when I got yeah. there. See, I got there kind of late. It took a while before I could actually go to Korea. So they. And they, by the way, I went to Korea by myself. I volunteered for uh, overseas service in the Far East, which meant Korea. Uh, none of my buddies in my unit, 114th Combat Engineers, went overseas. Hmm. So you volunteered to go? Yes. Why? I Why? mean, you didn't. Why? You? Because uh, the communists were killing Americans and I didn't go into the army to uh, work in a rock quarry and build roads and piddle around in the United States when somebody had to do the fighting. Very good. So I did. Stupid, yeah. You know, young people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, uh, not everybody can sit back and... You want to do your duties. Yes. That's why I, I volunteered production. How about Daegu that you saw? Okay. How was it? Um, I like your description, so keep doing it because nobody knows. You are the only one who saw it, right? At okay. Here, and okay. students and teachers will learn from you. So describe the scene that you saw, Daegu. Okay. How was people, how was city? Okay, uh, all through South Korea. Uh, uh, I, I didn't get down on my knees and shoot craps. I looked out the window. I wanted to see. Uh, I see what was going on. It was a different country. And uh, I saw peasants and in, at the railroad stations in the little towns we went through, there were lots and lots and lots of, of women and children and old men and they were in bad shape. Uh, if we could have had more to give them, we would have done it. But we gave them about everything we had. We had some sea rations and candy bars and, uh, you know, piddly stuff. It didn't amount to much, but these were hungry people and, and just devastated. Uh, it, was, it was pitiful. Hmm. And it made me glad that I came, uh, that I could help them. So, Daegu was also miserable at the time. And what about Seoul? Well, okay. Uh, at Taegu, we stayed in tents, by the way. It yeah. was a, yeah. a set just for overnight. Yeah. And then we left again on the train right. and went on up to Seoul. Well, we went into the railroad station, which was shot up. But it was big and, and uh, it had been very nice at one time. And there when we got off the trains, uh, we were uh, hand-picked. They had officers there to, uh, with our records, to hand-pick the men they wanted for their unit. And uh, 
I was one who went to 3rd Infantry Division Replacement Company about five miles north of Seoul. Uh, we boarded trucks and headed up to the replacement company and then at that point we helped load trucks that went up Highway 3 uh, uh, north through Weejambu mm -hmm. and Yangsan and then uh, into the uh, Indian River area up toward Chorwon. Mm. And so you went to Chorwon too? Yes, I've been to Chorwon. Tell me about the Chorwon. When you were there, it was the middle of 1952, and there was severe battle, right? It was what? Severe battle. Severe battle. Uh, was it stalemate or severe battle? No. See, at that time, it was more stationary. The mobile war had ended, mm -hmm. and uh, we had terrain to defend. We we held the line against Chinese, always trying to push us off and take new territory. We it was trench warfare. It was a revision to World War One as far as the United States was concerned. That's right. I did a lot of patrolling, night patrolling, and defending outposts, and retaking outposts that the Chinese knocked some of our people off of, defending the, the main supply route. Well, so you did patrol, p patrol too? I sure did, yes. So there must be a lot of dangerous encounters with the with the Chinese and enemies, right? That's for sure. Yeah, any episode that you want to share with us? That you remember? Which one? I don't know. <laughs> you know. I've got my story, yeah. But you, anything that you, you want to share okay. that with us? Well, just that uh, everything seemed to happen at night. Uh, America controlled the skies in the daytime. Yeah. And uh, it was very, very, very dangerous. Uh, when we got into trouble as infantrymen, we could call in help from uh, a carrier setting out in the Sea of Japan or, or the other side and to get air support. Uh, napalm, terrible stuff. All of us were frightened of it. And Chinese too. Mm. And uh, that's when we got our markers out, our cloth, uh, red or yellow markers and laid them on the ground so that the planes wouldn't take us for the enemy and drop napalm on us. Uh, so the Chinese pretty well stayed undercover during the daytime, but when the planes couldn't fly and mm -hmm. we couldn't get help, then they'd come out at night and attack. It's like an ants, right? They just come out out of... And, and come out and come out and come out. We were always uh, outnumbered. Describe the details when you encounter those so many Chinese. How it happened? Well, um, we'd hear bugles or whistles or drums or uh, they were smart enough to do that rather than rely on uh, unreliable batteries and, and radios and so on that we did. Uh, that was the way they uh, maneuvered their their movements, uh, and then they, they'd come in out of the dark and, and uh, hit our outpost to, to knock us off the top. What was the scariest moments that you remember? Oh, gosh. I was scared all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, Somebody, people would have to be insane not to be scared uh, under those kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. The Chinese were good soldiers. These were survivors from the war the communists fought with the nationalists when they pushed them off the mainland. And they were equipped with American weapons that we had sent to Chiang Kai-shek and the national Chinese <laughs> to hopefully uh, so they could hold their country, and they were captured by the communists. And uh, it was weird to be shot at by 
M1 Garands and Thompson submachine guns and, and carbines, uh, our own weapons, there at the start. Mm. The Chinese were very worthy enemies. They were better than we were. Uh, fresh from the States, a recruit who, yes, had been trained to fight and kill in basic training, but had never pulled the trigger on an enemy, you know, uh, we all were worried in, about what kind of soldiers we'd make. And uh, we were pretty well handpicked by the time we got up on the front line. What were you thinking at the time that you had such intensive kind of battle mode with the Chinese? What were you thinking? Did you tell yourself that why am I here? Why am I here? What the hell am I doing here? No? I didn't question that. Okay. Because I'd seen the misery the, that the communists had inflicted on the South Korean people. I liked the South Korean people. Later on, after I was wounded, uh, I got to know uh, Korean civilians and all. We helped some orphans out. And, uh, and uh, back at 3rd Division Rear Headquarters, uh, we had Saturday afternoons and Sundays off, and I could get out to Seoul and around the neighborhood, and uh, and get to know the people. So, how was Seoul actually, and how was your interaction with the Korean people? Uh, we were five miles north of Seoul, the I think East Gate, on Highway Three. It had been Kangwon University uh, Commerce. Uh, building or something. It had been uh, shelled and was in pretty poor condition, but uh, our engineers put the windows back and made it uh, weatherproof enough so that we could have the whole 3rd Division headquarters in it. It was 3rd Division rear. Where? Five miles north of Seoul. Five but you told me that you were in the Choron Valley and so on. Okay, well, see, we, we made a jump here. Uh, I was uh, hit by shrapnel, mm. uh, wearing a, a armored vest. I got hit under the arm with a big piece of shrapnel that cracked two of my ribs and left a big uh, black and blue spot. A big piece went into where I sit down here and uh, went clear into my pelvic bone and uh, about a dozen others, smaller ones, pretty well peppered the left side of my body. And that one that went into my rear end uh, affected my left leg so I wasn't any good up on the line anymore. And I didn't want to go to the hospital. I, I was in denial. Uh, so rather than going to the hospital like I was supposed to do, I asked if there was a sedentary job that I could do while I was healing. Hmm. And so they sent me back down, uh, it was about what, like 30, 35 miles south to uh, division rear and uh, made me a special orders uh, typist. Hmm. and. Uh, I stayed there the rest of the my time in Korea. I became the uh, section chief of the classification and assignment section uh, in 15th Regimental Personnel. Uh, it was my job and the five men under me to uh, get trained replacements in as they were needed. as and to uh, rotate people out as they had enough points to rotate out of Korea. You know the rotation system. Uh, and uh, to uh, type up uh, letters of condolence to families who, who uh, lost people in our unit. And this is what I did for the rest of the time in Korea.
I came off the line. I didn't spend all my time up on mm. the line. So you were wounded, right? But you yes. were not into the hospital? I, I refused to go. And you didn't go? I didn't go. How did you survive it? I healed. I, I this wounded my butt uh, became infected and it had to be opened, but uh, we had a medic in our infantry okay, unit. Okay, yeah. And uh, he dug the shrapnel out of me and patched me up, and put a little sulfur powder in the wounds, and, and uh, I just toughed it out. Wow. Again, I didn't go into the army to lay in a hospital bed. Uh, what was your rank at the time? Uh, I ended up sergeant first class. Sergeant first class. And how much were you paid? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was combat pay and overseas pay and uh, combat infantry badge uh, was worth a little something and I, I didn't pay any attention to pay. Hundred fifty? Twenty? I don't really remember. Okay. So when did you leave Korea? Um, I had to leave in order to get home in time yeah. to be released from duty. Yeah, I was in it? January of 1953. And I was encouraged to extend my enlistment six months, and they promised me I'd be Master Sergeant if uh, <laughs> I stayed another six months. But I kind of added things up that uh, I lost, almost lost my life so many times. Uh, over here, and I miss my family, and I miss my country, and... Time to go. Yeah, I just didn't want to extend for six months. Oh, I figured no. I, it might be the end of me. You never knew from day to day, you know, from what would happen. Yeah. And now that I learned that uh, in July, uh, the armistice was signed, I kind of wished in other, since then, that I had a, extended that. I would have loved to have been in Korea when mm. the fighting ceased. But at that time that I had to make up my mind, I had nothing to go by. It could have lasted years longer. Yeah. What was the most difficult thing during your service in Korea? What was the most difficult thing? Saying goodbye to those orphans mm. when I left. Did you see many of the orphans? Oh yeah, there were little kids and old women. and We had mama sons outside the fence compound who washed our clothes in the river and amended them and uh, they made clothes out of sleeping bag covers and, and I, I got to know these people pretty well. And then these little kids, uh, little shoe shine boys and and little, uh, the little girls uh, outside with the mama sons and uh, really, really nice people. And uh, uh, in our personnel section we had uh, the personnel for Catoosas yeah. too. And uh, so I was lucky enough to get to know quite well, uh, he took the name of Victor. Uh, been too many years, a uh, Korean name, but uh, he was very fluent in English as well as Korean. And we spent a lot of time together visiting about his country and his family and, and the people of Korea. And uh, I was very impressed. It, uh, there was no orphanage there. There was in Seoul. And there were groups of people, uh, uh, military, who took care of kids in orphanages there. These were farm kids. This was a little village of Chung Dong. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went, the kids went to school in, nearby, and uh, we got to know them pretty well. It was the first chance I ever had to be a father. It was like being a father. Those kids depended on me and several of my buddies. We spent every penny that we could make uh, 
on those kits. We take them into Seoul on the Sundays and go to the market and and buy uh, clothes and and uh, food for them and uh, it just really was nice. Um, have you been back to Korea? No, I just I considered it, but I really didn't want to do it. Why? Why? Indeed, uh, it wouldn't be anything like it was when I left. I know it's uh, how it's grown up. It's marvelous. I've seen all kinds of pictures. I got the book that the South Koreans provided us, and I read every word and looked at every picture. But uh, if I travel that far again, I'd want to go to some other part of the world. Why? I, that's not a very good answer. I just, uh, I don't know, wouldn't be, I just wouldn't. You know that Korean government has a revisit program. Yes. They oh, invite yes. you back. Right? I have considered going. Yeah. And my buddies who've gone rave about it. It was wonderful. And they encouraged me to go. You should go. Well, not at my age, no. No, no, you are fine. You're I'm, fine. I'm 85 years old. Everybody is 85. On my legs. Everybody has a problem. <laughs> but they all went to Korea and they couldn't see. I mean, they couldn't believe their eyes. Yeah, I know. I think you need to see it. Oh, uh, yeah. With your own eye. Yeah. Uh, you let me know, okay? No, I won't go. You won't go, okay. So, you know what happened to Korea after you left, right? So much developments there. Well, I watched it closely and I'm so proud of what the South Korean people have done with the opportunities that we afforded them. It's the most unselfish thing I've ever done in my whole life to, uh, to be in the war in Korea. Mm. As I have more pride and having been a small part of that, probably than anything else in my life. And uh, uh, the South Koreans have just, it's wonderful uh, what they've done to their country. Uh, it made all of our sacrifices worthwhile. What if they turned out to be like North Korea? Right. My God, all they have to do is look over the border and see what they'd been like if uh, we hadn't helped them out there in, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, I'm, I'm just very proud of the little, little service that I did for them and very proud of my military uh, background. But why do not, why don't we teach about these things in our history class? They talk about Vietnam or they talk about World War II, but they don't talk about this success story. Why is that? I've noticed that, Dr. Hahn. <laughs> uh, yeah. Why is that? Yeah, why is it? We kind of got lost between World War II and Vietnam, I guess. Uh, uh, why? Well, for one thing, the last couple of years of the, of the war, the news people here in this country, if they mention anything about Korea at all, they stuck it on the back pages. I got home and uh, got in a taxi cab to, to go from a train station to a bus station, and the guy asked me why I was wearing a uniform. That American didn't even know a war was on. <laughs> And we were fighting and dying in Korea at the same time. That was while the war was still going on. And, uh, they got tired of it, and it cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's about Korea that Americans really didn't know anything about it because it's so small, it was so poor, it wasn't that important at all to them. Yeah, you know, Europe them. is their own country, right? They came from the, from the Europe, right? So they know about Europe. They know about England, France, Germany, 
Yeah. Because they are from there, yeah. right? Yeah. But Korea wasn't in the map of cognitive map of the American people at the time. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the West Coast had a lot of Chinese, uh, so I guess people out there knew about China maybe a little more, but uh, no. Uh, I don't know. So and, and, and you also know that it was a police action. Yeah. The Harry Truman uh, rather than going through Congress and getting Congress to declare a war, called it a police action and had people over there in Korea from Japan in about three days. Hmm. Now that was good, to act as quickly as he did, and to get the United Nations in on it. Uh, that's another thing. I was a part of the first United Nations that's right. combined uh, effort there. Uh, but. I'm awfully glad that uh, America made up the greatest number of the United Nations forces and they were uh, commanded by American commanders uh, because I think I would have had a, a bit of a time taking orders from some person from another country at the time. So how do you think we can fix this problem that the educate, education about Korea is not done enough? How can we do that? Well, uh, I'm chairman of the Tel-America Committee in my chapter. Chapter 150. That's right. Mm -hmm. And also commander of the Color Guard. And uh, in my 60s, what is it now, 63 or 4 years? Uh, since I got out of the Army, uh, believe me, I've let people know that the Korean War was real. I've written letters uh, to all kinds of newspapermen telling them, don't call this the Korean conflict or uh, so on. It was a full-blown war. And <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about it, and more people know about it now. That's why we're doing this. Okay, swell. So yeah. That's good. My foundation invites teachers, social studies and history teachers, into conference, and we educate them, and we bring them back to Korea, and we are making digital contents. So is that's the, exactly what Tell America program is supposed to do. And yeah. that's what we are doing, my foundation. That's well. Yeah. This is America and South Korea working together. Yes. And we have quite a history of doing that, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm proud of it too. Very good. I'm, re I'm really proud of your people. Uh, Any other message you want to leave to this interview? Anything that you missed? Oh, I missed. Much. Tons <laughs> of. But things that you think is need Mostly, to be... Mostly, uh, do you have a question that you'd like an answer to? No, that, that oh, I, no, I think I asked you most of the questions. Anything, any other things that you want to mention? You think that you didn't mention here, but it's important. Uh, No, I'll leave that up to you to ask me. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be glad to answer any question you have. Okay. Um, um, at 85, I don't have too many years left to answer any questions. So what would you say to the people who say that Korean War has been forgotten? Well, it sure hasn't been forgotten by me, or my family, or the families of any of the people who fought in Korea. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, every year since, the United States has had, well, 33,000 troops in South Korea for a long time. I think it's less now, more like 28,000 or something. But, uh, and the United States has 
has helped South Korea with a lot of money too. Yeah. And I don't begrudge a penny of it because the South Korean people uh, pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps and used that money wisely. Yeah. And they're a country to really be admired today. They're importers of our products and uh, have a, I understand, a democratic government. They've had uh, protests and things, young people, uh, probably communist-led as much as anything, I don't know. No. You know more about yeah. that. They're uh, just liberal. They are just small. Okay, well these things happen. Yeah. And look at America for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still the greatest country in the world. Yeah. Curtis, thank you very much for your fight and sacrifice for the Korean well, nation. I thank you for, yeah. for doing this. Uh, as we get as old as I am, uh, we start thinking about, we know we aren't going to live forever anymore like we thought we were going to do when we were 20. And uh, we start thinking about hoping that people will remember us after we're dead. And uh, these are the kind of things that will keep our memories going. It's just, it's ego, I guess. It's, uh, it doesn't make any difference in the, the timeline of the world or anything, but personally, I think it's important to old people to, to be remembered. We'd like to think we made a difference. Yes. And, and, I, I think uh, there's most Korean veterans, some are pretty sour, but most Korean veterans uh, don't really have to worry that during their lives they did something to make a difference. When they look at your country and see what you have done, uh, it could have been just like North Korea. Thank you again. You made a point, and that's the legacy of the Korean War. We don't want to forget. We want to continue to teach the lesson of the Korean War. And that's how we want to preserve and remember your honorable service. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're sure welcome.